over to Michelle Yap, who is going to be presenting on COVID venom cytotoxins. Are these cytolytic or cytotoxic? OK, thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to all the friends from different time zones and happy Halloween in advance. Um, I'm happy to share with you on my study on cobra venom cytotoxins, looking at whether it's a cytolytic or a cytotoxic agent. OK, um, in our study, we actually focus on the cytotoxin, namely Suma CTX from Naja Sumatrana venom. Just a heads up to what is a cytotoxin. Um, cytotoxin, or in abbreviation, we call it as a CTX, is a very basic polypeptide, belongs to a three-finger toxin family, contains three anti-parallel beta-stranded loops that form the hydrophobic regions of the toxin. So our interest in, of the cobra species is Naja Sumatrana, which is commonly known as equatorial splitting cobra. So it is a highly venomous snake, belongs to Elapidae family, and it was recognized as a category one, which is the highest medical importance venomous snakes by WHO. So Naja Sumatrana and Venomation is clinically manifested as systemic neuromuscular paralysis of tamia and local tissue necrosis. Well, a comparison between four different Southeast Asian cobra venoms revealed that this Naja Sumatrana venom has the highest percentage of CTX, while this was further proven by its venom proteum of about 44% of this venom uh, protein consists of uh, CTX. And interesting to note that uh, Suma CTX actually has a lower systemic bioavailability, indicating its higher binding affinity to the tissues. Thus, it plays an important role in causing the local uh, tissue necrosis. We actually checked the cytotoxicity of the Suma CTX against several uh, malignant cell lines and in comparisons to the normal cell lines. So our results show that this MCF7 was the most susceptible cell lines towards uh, Suma CTX. Furthermore, the toxin also exhibit higher selectivity towards MCF7 when compared to the human bronchial epithelial cells. And when we compare the cytotoxicity of Suma CTX at two different time points, which is 24 and 48 hours, there was actually no significant difference observed. So this suggests that uh, possibly the cytotoxicity of Suma CTX actually occur before 24 hours. So subsequently, we studied the possible apoptosis activations in the Suma CTX treated cells, whereby we examined the caspase 37 activity, the mitochondrial mediated potential, and later on we used the annexin 5 PI staining assays to check the occurrence of apoptosis. So we actually observed, of course, activation of caspase 3 and 7 at IC50 values, which is 4 microgram per mil. While in the mitochondrial membrane potential, we first observed an initial elevations of the JC1 fluorescence intensity ratio at the lowest treatment concentration when compared to the untreated cells. So this actually tells us a potential of mitochondrial hyperpolarization which is presumably a prerequisite and sensitization event before the depolarization of mitochondria. So as the concentrations, uh, the treatment concentration increase beyond two microgram per mil, the mitochondrial membrane integrity appears to compromise, leading to a typical apoptosis associated depolarization. While as revealed by the annexin 5 PI assay, the overall A5 positive cells actually exceeded the A5 positive, PI positive cell population and PI positive cell population at all time points. So it's interesting to note that at higher toxins concentration, prolonged exposure times of the Suma CTX in the MCF7 did not further elevate the caspase activity progressions of the mitochondrial depolarization and apoptosis. Well, since the annexin 5 and PI assay detect uh, accountable levels of the PI positive population at high toxins concentration, we would like to investigate the occurrence of the necrosis. So a double sandwich ELISA was adopted to measure the levels of free HMGB1. So what exactly is this 
HMGB1. Well, it's good to know that under the normal physiological conditions, the HMGB1 is bound to chromatin in the nucleus and will only be externalized to the extracellular space in the free form during necrosis. Whereas in apoptotic cells, the HMGB1 undergoes post-translational modification, which enables them to adhere tightly to the chromatin in the form of bound HMGB1. Thus, the release of the free HMGB1 can clearly differentiate necrosis from apoptosis. But in our study, there was undetectable HMGB1, even at the highest toxin concentration. So this may imply that this uh, toxin CTX did not induce a primary necrosis in MCF7 cells. It ignites another question whether the cells progress into secondary necrosis, which also gives a PI positive staining. This is because even the cell switch to secondary necrosis, it will still exist in a bound HMGB1. And furthermore, in secondary necrotic cells, there will be caspase activation. We did not just stop here. Since considerable percentage of PI positive populations are observed, and it did not indicate occurrence of primary necrosis. So we examined the degree of membrane permeabilizations by measuring the LDH, um, extra LDH levels, which is an indicator of membrane permeabilization and then further support with the fluorescence dye, calcin and PI. So um, as the toxins concentration increase, we can see here that um, at a lower exposure time, only high toxins concentrations are capable to induce the membrane permeabilization. But as the toxins concentration actually increase, prolonged exposure time do not promote membrane permeabilization. And from the quantitative data shown by the calcin and PI assay, the calcin and PI ratio was actually higher at the lower toxins concentration over a prolonged exposure time. But as the concentration increased, even a shorter exposure time will have a lower calcin and PI ratio. So an increased toxins concentration causes a more prominent membrane permeabilization which suggests that the prolonged exposure time did not promote the progression of membrane permeabilization. So collectively, our results demonstrate a more rapid onset of membrane permeabilization when the cells were exposed to high concentration of toxins within a short period of time. So what is next? So based on our earlier findings, it shows a caspase activated and mitochondrial mediated apoptosis at low toxins concentration. And when the toxins concentration actually increase, we observe a considerable percentage of the PI, popula PI positive population, but the absence of free HMGB1 suggests that there's not a primary necrosis with concentration dependent membrane permeabilization. So the question here is what exactly happens when the toxins concentration increase? So we intend to measure the intracellular proteins following the membrane permeabilization by using a label free quantitative proteomics to actually monitor the secretome, which represents the total cellular proteins that are secreted into the cell, extracellular medium following the membrane permeabilization. So um, from the LFQ, it actually indicates the release of the intracellular proteins following membrane permeabilization, whereby at higher toxins concentration, as shown in this heat map, the red color here, shows a higher expression levels of the proteins which indicates membrane permeabilization. Why is it so? Because an increased leakage of the intracellular proteins due to increased membrane permeabilization result in an increased detection level of the secretome. We then perform the pathway analysis to identify the differentially expressed proteins, the role of these proteins in different pathways. While most of the differentially expressed proteins identified are involved in carbon metabolisms, such as glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So in, it's good to know that the metlinin cell lines are normally express high levels of metabolic enzymes because they have higher energy demand for their survival and tumorigenesis. And now these metabolic enzymes are detected in the secretome, suggests that following the membrane permeabilization at high toxin concentration, it causes the leakage of these metabolic enzymes that lead to metabolic depreciation. We also found high levels of HIF uh, signaling pathway proteins, 
which are PCAM2 and LDH. This pathway is normally activated under hypoxic condition to maintain ATP levels, which is crucial for the cell survival as well. So um, from here, we can suggest that the SUMA CTX actually cause a stress response in the MCF7 to activate the HIF1 pathway. So together with the loss of metabolic enzymes, failure to execute the HIF1 signaling pathway contribute to SUMA CTX induced cell death. Hey, Michelle, just mentioning that you're at 10 minutes, so if you could wrap it up, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Thank I'll you. just quickly wrap it up here. So overall, this uh, high SUMA CTX, actually, it, when there's an increase in SUMA CTX concentration, it leads to an activation of necroptosis and eventually disrupt the intracellular cytoskeletal network, which promote the membrane permeabilizations and the leakage of the metabolic enzymes lead to metabolic deprivation associated with the inflammation due to the activation of inflammatory pathway. This, is, uh, this causes further cellular damage. So um, in summary, so this at low toxin concentration, the SUMA CTX actually triggers a apoptosis and a cytotoxicity is a concentration dependent but not time dependent process. But when the toxin concentration increases, it actually triggers a stress response, activates a necroptosis leading to this membrane permeabilization and subsequently metabolic deprivations that causes a cell death with inflammation. So we conclude that um, this SUMA CTX actually causes a transition of the cell death from low concentrations to high concentration okay, in the form from apoptosis to necroptosis. So the CTX elicits cytotoxicity more than just cytolytic actions. Yeah, I will just stop here. Thanks. Brilliant. All right. Yeah. We will hand over to Rohit, who will be asking questions from the attendees. Thanks a lot, Michelle. So okay. we've got the first question here. Um, will improving understanding of the signaling pathways lead to new therapeutic approaches or targets? Did you get that, Michelle? Sorry. Sorry, can you repeat again the question? Of course. Um, will improving understanding the signaling pathways lead to new therapeutic <laughs> approaches or targets? Um, I would think so. Of course, there are lots more that we can study on the signaling pathway, but at least at this moment, we know what exactly happened when there is increased exposures to the CTX. It will actually tell us what exactly happened um, when there's high toxic concentration. Although what we are doing now is on a malignant cells, and in the lab now, we are also working on studying on human skin cells to see whether in real pathogenesis, whether this necroptosis is also what's happening. So this is our ultimate comparisons with a malignant cell. Different cell types will have different activation of signaling in response to different um, concentrations of the CTX. Okay, um, and are there any other venom components that could be worked mm. synergistically with the cytotoxins? Um, I would think the most cl the closest toxins components would be basic phospholipase A2. That could probably produce the same cytotoxic effects as the CTX. Yeah, um, and uh, so I just wanted to ask about the method of uh, measuring membrane permeabilization and um, mm. what, what I couldn't. I just ask again, what, what were the kind of IC50s you were seeing in those assays? Okay, um, so on the cytotoxic assay, actually the cytotoxic assay, the IC50 that we determine is about 3.5 to 3.8. So we run it off to 4 microgram per mil. But in terms of membrane permeabilizations, at different time we had different um, IC50 values. So at shorter time, we actually observe a eight, around 8 microgram per mil of IC50. While the IC50 in the membrane permeabilization represents the concentration that causes 50% of the cells populations to be permeabilized. So it depends on the types of the assays that 
you use to measure and the definitions of the IC50 that um, you want to define the concentration. Yeah. And did you, is, have you just done this with the Sumatrana venom? Have you tried this with any of the other cobras? Um, I have not tried any, but currently in the lab, we are actually working on the CTX, which have the conserved sequence, whereby yeah. it covers all different types of isoforms from different cobra species, from different geographical origins. So we are also working towards that. Yeah, uh, we just mm. had a question more come in now. Why does such a neurotoxic snake have these necrotic inflammatory toxins? Okay, um, I would say the presence of the CTX and basic PLA2. Yeah. Due to the presence of basic PLA2 and the CTX. Yeah. Of course, clinically, um, the main pathogenesis is still on neuromuscular paralysis, ven uh, ventilatory failure. Those are the common symptoms that we observe. But the local necrosis shouldn't be um, omitted as well in dealing with such a neurotoxic snakes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, last question, uh, how do you think the cytotoxin gets into the cell? Okay, this is actually a good question and this is what we are actually working on now. Um, I don't have time to share what, um, because there's a one last slide that I want to share. Currently, we are look, looking at the molecular target that this Suma CTX can actually interact and goes into the cells. So from our earlier docking um, results, of course, we need to support it further with the experimental assay. Um, we speculate that the TNF receptor could be the molecular target. So there might be some internalization routes that we are looking at, and we actually postulate that concentration of the toxin plays a role, whereby at low concentrations, um, the receptor may be the internalization route for the toxins, but when the toxins concentration increase, as you can see here, is the permeabilization will be the main route of internalization. But we are still looking at the possibility of the internalization, and hopefully we'll share more when we find more results here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Michelle.